KETV Newswatch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. And welcome to our special year in review edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Julie Cornell. We put together the top 10 stories of 2017, courtesy of our digital team here at KETV. Yeah, we looked at what was most popular online, tallying up the, the numbers from our mobile app, from our desktop clicks, and from all those Facebook posts. The collection of stories is a snapshot of what's happened over the past 12 months. We start with former President Barack Obama's surprise visit to Omaha. He wasn't here long, but his quick trip in March got a lot of attention. President Obama went to Happy Hollow Country Club, where he had lunch with local billionaire Warren Buffett and his daughter Susie. Susie Buffett declined to say what they discussed during the private lunch, but all three left the country club together, acknowledging a small crowd of spectators who had gathered. President Obama went by with his motorcade. He just rolled down the window and waved, but still cool. Was that exciting? Yeah, that was very exciting. She got to say hello, and then around 3.30, the motorcade pulled up to a private jet at Epley Airfield. Obama boarded the plane and flew off to San Jose. Coming in at number nine, our year-long commitment to the state of addiction. In October, DEA agents made a massive fentanyl bus, stopping a suspected trafficker on a train. Now, this version of the drug is so powerful, just a few milligrams can be lethal. So you can imagine what this could do. That's 30 pounds of fentanyl, enough potentially deadly doses to kill almost everyone in Nebraska and Iowa. With more on the bust, here's KETV News Watch Evans' Camilla Ortiz. Just before 9 a.m. Wednesday, the Amtrak train pulls up to the station on South 9th Street. Routine, just like the surveillance checks being done by two undercover officers. We have officers that are trained to pick out people that are different than the normal traveling public. They picked out this man, 27-year-old Edgar Navarro Aguirre, who officials say was carrying 33 pounds of pure fentanyl in a suitcase the most fentanyl Nebraska authorities have come across at once ever. I think it was literally one mishap away from something extremely tragic for Nebraska. That's because the opioid is about 50 times more potent than heroin and can be deadly to the touch. Experts say it only takes about three milligrams pictured here. That means the 33 pounds the officers found would be enough lethal doses for 4.9 million people. This is playing Russian roulette knowing that every cylinder's got a bullet in it. DEA agent in charge Matt Barden says this only solidifies what law enforcement agencies have already known. The dangers and popularity of this opioid are only growing. Worst epidemic that that I can assure you that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. State troopers and DEA agents proud they put a stop to this shipment believed to have been heading to the East Coast and encourage the public to be vigilant. We all need to be on the lookout for suspicious activities. We all need to speak up and speak out. That was Camilla Ortiz reporting. DEA says the drug seized in this case had a street value of somewhere around $15 million. Another high-profile story that generated tens of thousands of clicks, the in-custody death of Zachary Bearheels. Bearheels was mentally ill and died in June after police were called to a convenience store. Now, cruiser camera video shows police first putting Bearheels in handcuffs and placing him in the back of a cruiser. He was able to get out, and that's when officers Scotty Payne and Ryan McClarty arrived, eventually deploying a taser 12 times to get Bearheels under control. Medics took Bear Heels to the hospital, where he later died from excited delirium. And in December, a grand jury ruled that two former Omaha police officers should face criminal charges. KETV Newswatch 7's Michelle Bandor takes a closer look at the findings. Scotty Payne's defense attorney was actually the one who insisted on a grand jury investigation after the Douglas County attorney initially filed charges against the officers. We're the ones that asked for it, and the old line, be careful what you wish for. Confirmed, I believe, what we thought earlier, uh, almost ex the same exact charges that we had filed. The grand jury sifted through 800 pieces of evidence and listened to testimony from 20 witnesses. 
but it didn't hear from the officers. Leffler says it was his team's tactical decision to not have Payne and other experts testify. So they only heard one side of things. The indictment confirmed the charges, misdemeanor assault for McClarity, felony assault for Payne, plus a new charge, use of a deadly weapon. The jurors determined Bear Heels died from excited delirium and made three recommendations. Suggest the actions and inactions by Supervising Sergeant Eric Forehead contributed to the outcome. Propose mandatory annual training for police officers on interacting with the mentally ill and mandatory crisis intervention training. Police Chief Todd Schmader gave us this statement. OPD mental health training has already been part of our department-wide annual training, and we will continue to make that a priority. In addition to the annual training, our CIT training has tripled for 2018. Ma'am, what's your name? Crisis intervention team training, like this scenario. We showed you the police training last month, which prepares officers on how to interact with mentally ill people. Stop! Chief Schmader hopes this training will save lives in the community. That was Michelle Bandeau reporting. The Omaha Police Officers Union President John Wells says he doesn't believe the officers' actions should amount to criminal charges. All right, coming in at number seven, those tiny bugs that have a big bite and leave a large whelp. They're called pirate bugs, and they were especially active this fall. Here again, KATV News Watch 7's Camilla Ortiz. You can find the insects in grassy, tree-covered areas like this, but this time of the year, they're doing a lot more of finding you. The minute pirate bug is out in full force. Definitely a case of good bug gone bad. The tiny black insects, only one-eighth of an inch long, hide on rainy days like today, <laughs> but swarmed thousands of runners participating in the market-to-market -market relay over the weekend. They were just, like, Falling out of the sky, it seemed, into the van, onto our clothes. Um, I got a lot of bites on my neck. They would just bite constantly, and you'd just be shooing them off your body all the time. Local experts say they're not actually biting. They're not eating you. They're not injecting you with anything. They're just trying to decipher what it is they've landed on. Using their sharp, beak-like mouth to poke you. University of Nebraska entomologist Jonathan Larson says the pirate bugs typically eat insect eggs and other smaller bugs, but when fields are being harvested or drying up in the fall, they're on the move. And so they're looking for new places to hide and new sources of food, and they get confused and think that we may be that. The results aren't pretty, and Larson says there may be more pirate bugs to watch out for this season thanks to an ideal summer. It wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold, there was plenty of moisture, and there was plenty of food for everybody. Reporting in Omaha, Camilla Ortiz, KETV News Watch 7. All right, we're going to be back with more of this year's top stories, including a convicted serial killer sentenced to death, and the event that had the whole country watching Nebraska skies. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. And welcome back to KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Well, this morning we're counting down the top 10 stories of the year. At number six, the hotly contested Omaha mayor's race. Jean Stothert won re-election in May. She got 53% of the vote, beating Heath Mello by a 6,400 vote margin. You could feel the excite excitement in the air as the election results rolled. KETV News Watch 7 was there as the mayor spoke to Mello on the phone. Mello conceding and Stothert's family and campaign celebrating. Afterward, Mayor Stothert thanked the voters. And now together, all together, we will continue the important work of making Omaha more safe, vibrant, financially strong, and inclusive. We, we, will, build on, yes, we will build on the progress that we achieved by the work of thousands over time and lead our city to the great potential that is now before us. It was a different scene at Heath Mello's campaign. The first time we saw him was when he took the stage to concede the race. We wouldn't be up here tonight without the strong support and the unwavering support of the men and women of organized labor across this city. Members, I can tell you we as a campaign would not be on this stage, would not have received as many votes as we did tonight or have seen what we believe is really amazing progress as a city over the last eight months without your support. Voter turnout for the election was 34%.
We're now halfway through the list. And the fifth most popular story, the Great Eclipse. So many people came from all over the country to see the path of totality right here in Nebraska. Well, here's the breakdown from the Tourism Commission. 708,000 people traveled to watch the eclipse. Officials think 87% of those were from out of state. That makes the event the greatest single tourist event on record. Now, on August 21st, a huge swath of the state went dark, including Beatrice, which was where KATV News Watch 7's David Earl spent the day. The sun was still rising at the Homestead National Monument when people from all over came to claim their solar spots. I'm hoping to see something that's a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. Um, I actually just purchased this scope about, about nine months ago. Months of preparation for Lee Wolfson from Minneapolis. Months of preparation for organizers from the National Park Service. And months of preparation at the Beatrice Airport. 200 planes, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel. And the Civil Air Patrol on hand. We're trying to make sure that everything is safe and uh, the planes are adequately parked and don't run into holes and cause problems. Some started to despair as they looked at the sky, but then, as if right on cue. Everything just opened up and, and the drama of it opening up in the last minutes. Call it a heavenly intervention. It wasn't going to happen and I was willing to accept that, but then it started to happen and it was just uh, indescribable. Yeah. I can't even put it into words. The strangeness of it, the wonderfulness of it. Two minutes and 35 seconds of it. As it ended, the crowd all smiles, standing in long lines to leave with a memory they'll never forget. In Beatrice, David Earl, KETV News Watch 7. Officials estimate the economic impact at $127 million from all the lodging and travel expenses. Right, they say the average visitor spent three days in the state, and tourism leaders say 45% said they plan to come back here to visit in the next two to five years. All right, coming in at number four, four death sentences. Four years after the killings, justice for Nico Jenkins' victims. One of the judges calls it one of the worst killing sprees in Nebraska history. In May, Jenkins was sentenced to death plus up to 500 years behind bars. That was the maximum. And as KETV Newswatch 7's Michelle Bandeau reports, it's what the families of the victims have been waiting for. It may be a death sentence for Nico Jenkins. Justify the imposition of a sentence of death for each murder. But for the mother of one of his victims, Curtis Bradford, she can now live again. He's had power over my life for four years, and I've struggled for four years. He don't get that power today. It was the summer of 2013. Jenkins had just gotten out of prison when he went on a 10-day killing spree. First shooting Jorge Caiga Ruiz and Juan Uribe Peña. Then Curtis Bradford, and he randomly targeted Andrea Kruger, as she drove home from work in northwest Omaha. Kruger's parents sat quietly in court, hanging on to the judge's every word, now feeling a sense of relief. We're just glad it's over with. It's been a long time, too long. Yeah. How are you, what were you thinking when you came into today? I kind of thought I'd go this direction, and I'm good with that. The Douglas County attorney says the three judges did the right thing for the families and for the community. And rest assured that Nico Jenkins will never be able to hurt anybody again on the outside. Glasgow says her son and her faith give her strength to move on. I'll never forget him. I love him forever, but it's time for me to heal, and I'm ready. So I'm ready for peace. For all the victims' families, peace and each other is what they have to hold on to now that this has come to an end. That was Michelle Bender reporting. Now Jenkins had plenty of help in his crime spree from his mother to his sister to his uncle. They're all in prison. All right, you're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning, we're looking back at 2017 and the top stories of the year. Yeah, and we'll be back with the top three when we come back. Welcome back. You are watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Right. This morning, we're looking back at 2017 and the top stories of the year. All right. We're down to number three. It's one many of us will never forget. Pottawatomie County Deputy Mark Burbridge shot and killed in the line of duty by an inmate just sentenced. An inmate with nothing to lose. Yeah, Wesley Correa Carminati ended up pleading guilty 
got life in prison. During his sentencing, Deputy Burbridge's children addressed their dad's killer. And now that you're sitting in front of me, I want you to know that you got lucky. You got lucky my dad didn't grab his gun first and put the bullet in you. I will personally guarantee you that there are over 10,000 law enforcement officers that want to put a bullet in his head that day and call it good. But they could and that's why he's able to sit here today. I just want you to know that there are things that are going to happen to you where you're going. Things so painful and terrible, you'll wish you got the death penalty, which you deserve. And it is still tough for Mark Burbridge's colleagues to watch the video of his final moments. The incident, however, did prompt some changes, as KATV News Watch 7's Taylor Barth reports. I don't know that we're ever going to be the same. A long three months for Pottawatomie County Sheriff Jeff Danker and his department. Waiting for this day to come. I think it's part of a closure, a healing process to go through. This was the first time Sheriff Danker watched the escape since the day it happened. It's kind of like opening a wound again, going through this, but it's something that it was going to have to be done and fortunately didn't have to go through a trial. Despite months of hard work, County Attorney Matt Wilbur is also thankful for the outcome. The victims didn't have to go through, uh, you know, the hell of a trial. Um, we don't have to worry about the appeal issues now. I mean, it's just done. We just get to close the book. He's already off in the pen and uh, we can move on. Moving on means applying lessons learned. The sheriff's office already changed its policy when transporting inmates in and out of the Sally port. At uh, this time, one of the deputies will, will step back away and be armed, and the other deputy will secure his weapon, get them out, get them secured in the jail facility. The sheriff's office also looking at a body scanner that could detect hidden contraband. I mean, clearly the lesson is, you can never, ever at all let your guard down with some of these folks. Part of your the case comes to a close while Deputy Burbridge's legacy lives on. I don't know how you move on from something like this. I mean, I still see, I go downtown and I still see blue tape, uh, you know, across windows. Um, I see a lot of people wearing, sorry, Mark shirts. It's just, uh, I think it's going to take a while. That was Taylor Barth reporting again. Correa Carminati will spend the rest of his life in prison. Number two on our list, the night of June 16th, that's when seven tornadoes touched down in Nebraska. That included an EF-2, which hit just south of Offutt Air Force Base in Bellevue. It stayed on the ground for more than nine miles. I saw that it was pretty much gone, and I was on the phone with her at the time, and all I could say was just, oh my gosh, Mom, oh my gosh. Basically both cried, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. There was one moment where we felt, we actually felt the cabin lift up like about three times in the middle of this storm. We jumped on this cabin right next to us, the patio, because the trees were flying at us. And then we looked over to our right, and we could see our neighbor's house, and then we realized that the um, side of the wall had blown out, and things were just starting to fly all out. When I got here, I just stopped crying. I just like, oh my God. And we could hear metal tearing and ripping. Uh, we have a large section of steel that got ripped off the back end of the building. First thing I thought of was look at all the work. We just saw the wind and we looked out and we saw the shed was gone. It could have been a lot worse. Folks, folks took the right precautions. Um, they prepared the base for this rapidly developing weather. Got down next to a couch and started praying and said, God, I need you to protect me. And We're happy to see them today. You might see us drive by and things like that. and. Uh, you just got to have some patience. Uh, these guys are working uh, pretty hard. Just the inconvenience of, you know, not having full use of your home, not having power, you know, in our case, water and electricity and air conditioning and things, but nobody's hurt. So it's a blessing that that was the case. Such a frightening time. At the height of the storm, as many as 76,000 customers in the Omaha Metro were without power. Well, the cleanup, it was daunting. The damage from that Friday night twister in Bellevue meant tons of heavy lifting. But as KETV Newswatch 7 Sarah Feely reports, everyone pitched in. Compelled to serve, the Bellevue East football team tackled debris cleanup in the Hyde Hills neighborhood. Friday, the area was ravaged by an EF2 tornado. Debris litters the ground, but not for long. After his team's morning workout Monday, assistant coach Rob Mason asked for volunteers. He didn't know what to expect, but knew he had a good group of guys. When I pulled up and just seeing guys pour out of cars, uh, it was pretty awesome. It's probably going to hit me a little bit more even later. Senior Colton Patrick felt it was his duty to be here. I don't think it really hits you 
quite as hard until you actually see it for yourself. Patrick and his teammates say they wanted to practice what they preach. Grit, teamwork, being part of a family and a community, uh, just giving back because ultimately it's about being a part of something bigger than yourself, and we feel like that's something that is incredibly important in life. Around 30 football players volunteered to pick up the pieces of the Bellevue neighborhood. Coach Mason wants this to leave a lasting impact. Instead of just writing a check or starting a hashtag, like actually physically making a difference in someone's lives is, is I think, what we're really hoping here. Patrick says the experience has made him grateful for many things, but especially for his community. It's astonishing to see how much they've gone through and how they're able to be humbled and still kind and energetic about this and everything in this entire experience. Those are some fine young men. Those storms caused an estimated $13 million in damage. Well, money was just one part of the top story of the year. The firings of Sean Eichhorst and Mike Riley and the hiring of Bill Moose and Scott Frost all started in late September when the University of Nebraska-Lincoln got rid of Eichhorst. Three weeks later, Bill Moose was hired to lead the Husker Athletic Department. Well, after the football team's dismal 4-8 and eight record, Mike Riley was let go too. I remain confident that the pieces are in place, the program to continue to grow. And what we didn't show enough of in these changing times this last year was enough football to continue, and I understand that part of it. Now, by the year 2021, the university will pay at least $19.4 million to people not coaching the Huskers. $6.6 .6 million goes to Mike Riley. His assistants will get $4.6 million. Bo Pelini is still collecting $128,000 a month until February of 2019. That's six and a half million total. University also has to pay former athletic director Sean Eichhorst. He had 1.7 million left on his contract. Well, a week later, Nebraska had hired Scott Frost. And here's Andy Kendi with our number one story of the year. The last time Nebraska had a head football coaching vacancy was three years ago. Scott Frost didn't even get a phone call, wasn't even considered. Frost, though, said he's okay with that, saying the timing wasn't right. But now the leadership is in place, and Frost felt comfortable enough to return home to become the Huskers' next head coach. It gives me a great deal of pleasure at this time to introduce the 30th head football coach at the University of Nebraska, Scott Frost. It's a happy homecoming for Scott Frost. Words can't describe how much it means to me to be back here. Frost bringing home traits he learned as a Husker quarterback. It's toughness, it's dedication, it's work ethic. That's what Nebraska is, that's what the people of Nebraska are, and that's what this place is going to stand for while I'm here. He's a, a guy that uh, understands, because he lived it, uh, what's important here. And I think he'll get back to those basics, and uh, he'll bring a lot of new things to the table as well. We're going to work harder than everybody else. That's what Nebraska's about. And we're going to be a more united team than anybody else. That's what Nebraska's about. Frost directed the top-scoring offense in the country at UCF this season. So does the new head coach expect to modify his offensive approach going to the Big Ten? I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> Frost has two major priorities now in the upcoming days. Number one, assemble his coaching staff. And number two is recruit, which he says has already begun. The early signing date is December 20th. Outside Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Andy Kendi, KTV News Watch 7 Sports. All right. Remember, if you missed any part of this show or you want to watch it again, it's online right now on KETV.com. Just go to our homepage, click on the menu button there, and look for Chronicle. I suppose maybe one or two people were interested in that uh, Scott Frost story, you think? Oh, just a couple. <laughs> just yeah. a couple. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. I'm Rob McCarthy. I'm Julie Cornell. <laughs> we'll see you back here next Sunday morning.